Good evening. So my name is Odile Aman. I'm an associate professor at the University of Lausanne, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this public event, which is part of the workshop Vested Interest in Democracy, which I'm organizing together with my colleague Olivier Richer from the University of Zurich. We also very much benefited from the help of Sofia Bolo, who is here tonight. We are delighted and honored to welcome Professor Emanuela Cheva from the University of Geneva, who kindly accepted our invitation to deliver a keynote lecture for a workshop and who is joining us virtually this evening. Professor Cheva is a full professor of political theory at the Department of Political Science and International Relations of the University of Geneva. Her research focuses on themes of justice, democracy, corruption, trust, and the political role of moral emotions. She has published widely on these themes, including a monograph titled Political Corruption, published this year with Oxford University Press, together with Maria Paola Ferretti, a monograph which I can warmly recommend. Professor Cheva has held visiting fellowships at the universities of Oxford, Harvard, and St. Andrews, among others. And in 2018, she was a Fulbright Research Scholar at the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Professor Cheva's talk is titled Accountable Public Institutions. And it starts from the observation that we believe that public institutions must be accountable, but that we actually struggle to understand what being accountable means. And given the high relevance and complexity of this topic, I am very curious to, to learn more about her research and about her findings. Emanuela, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We very much look forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Odile, for your very uh, kind and warm uh, introduction. And I'd really like to thank uh, the organizers uh, of the workshop. I was uh, able to attend um, one of the earlier events and the quality of the talks uh, that I heard was uh, actually very uh, high and stimulating. So it's even more uh, uh, sad for me not uh, being able to be there uh, in presence with, with you uh, tonight uh, and tomorrow. Uh, but um, nevertheless, uh, I'm really, really happy to be able to discuss with you um, the, um, the state of the art uh, of my uh, own thinking uh, about the accountability of public institutions, uh, which draws on uh, work uh, to which uh, Odile made a uh, kind reference in his introduction, that is my work uh, on uh, corruption. So you see, as um, someone who has started thinking about uh, the normative qualities of uh, institutional action from uh, a negative perspective, diving into the problem of corruption. At some point, um, it becomes necessary uh, to take a step back and uh, ask some more positive questions in terms of, uh, okay, now we are understanding uh, what kind of wrong uh, may distract institutions from their proper working and functioning. But let's also think about the positive side of the story. Uh, how should institutions be structured internally to work uh, in ways that are appropriate uh, to their to the function that they play uh, in society. And um, I will be starting sharing my screen in a minute, but just to give you a bit of a context, um, this, um, the current research I'm carrying out um, is within this framework, uh, uh, a contribution to the emerging field of the philosophy of governance. Uh, as uh, those of you who have a background in political philosophy and theory uh, are well aware of, uh, the large part of the normative research in political philosophy and theory has been uh, in the past uh, in century um, or so uh, mainly concerned with 
the normative ideals of justice and legitimacy of institutions. So when political theorists ask normative questions about the quality of institutions, how should good institutions be, they mean either uh, of the two things. So how should us institutions be structured in order to be legitimate, that is to have um, a rightful claim to authority, or um, how should they be structured in order to be just, that is to be capable of realizing some sort of uh, fair and equal scheme of cooperation in society, provide for social goods, cater for the public interest, depending on the normative theory of justice that uh, people favor. But um, certainly, uh, no matter how um, well um, structured uh, institutions are and well designed they are in terms of their respect in justice or legitimacy, uh, an equally important question is how institutions should be structured in their daily working in order to be capable to stand up to the higher ideas of justice and legitimacy uh, with respect to which they were uh, originally designed. So uh, my current research concerns mainly the normative property of, that characterizing the working of uh, the institution. You may call it uh, the property of institutional well functioning or institutional operability. Uh, I'm still switching a bit uh, between uh, formulations at the moment. Uh, but the question is how the um, working of an institution in its ordinary routine should be structured in order uh, for it to be um, a good institution, in order to stand up the normative idea that inform its raison d'etre, uh, whatever it is. And one such standard uh, of which I would like to talk about um, with you today is the normative standard of uh, accountability. So to get um, a bit into um, the uh, details of um, what uh, I'm thinking about. So as um, Odile mentioned in her uh, introduction, uh, there is uh, my, my thinking here starts from a very basic uh, element of common sense. That is well-functioning, whatever well-functioning public institution is, it must be accountable for its action in some way. And um, when I speak about and when I be talking about uh, the well functioning of public institutions, the accountability of public institutions today, I will adopt a very broad and encompassing understanding of what public institutions are. So they would include governmental bodies like parliamentary assemblies, providers of public services, for instance, state schools, hospitals, or job centers, and even administrative bodies, so uh, for instance, tribunals. So when I shall be referring to public institutions and to the office orders in public institutions, please bear in mind this panoply of institutional structures and subjects, starting from elected officials, uh, if you wish, down to street level bureaucrats. So um, the common sense uh, of which, from which I started basically applies across all these various instances of what institu public institutions are. Um, unfortunately, as it often happens with common sense uh, observations, this common sense easily turns into an epic catch-all claim if we fail, uh, if we fail to provide an adequate analysis of what being accountable means in the context of institutional action. And uh, providing this account, and my view of this account, is my aim for um, this afternoon. So in order to do so, um, the best place to start, uh, I suggest, is by analyzing what institutional action is, quite unsurprisingly, uh, if you wish. So here, um, I'd like you to um, contrast uh, two views of public institutions. Uh, one view uh, would have uh, um, institutions as mainly structure of procedures. So what an institution is, an institution is a set of rules uh, and mechanisms through which public power is exercised. 
So the emphasis on this view of institution is on institutional mechanisms, the mechanisms through which public office works and functions. On the other hand, you have a role-based view of institutions, according to which um, the priority, the emphasis is better placed on uh, roles where institutions, rather than being conceived as mere structure of procedures, they are mainly considered as a structure of relations. So in this sense, uh, institutional action um, can be seen as having two components, if you wish. A more formal component, which concerns institutional mechanisms, the mechanisms office, and another more substantial component, which concerns what with um, office holders do with the powers that are entrusted to the office they occupy in virtue of the rules that govern those offices. So these views of public institutions are not alternative. They are combined in various ways in the normative account of institutional actions um, on offer. But uh, I would like you to um, consider uh, two main ways of considering the relation between these two views, or better, these two uh, nuances uh, given to uh, what makes uh, institutional action what it is. The first um, view uh, is um, a discontinuity view. On this view, the two elements I mentioned, rules and roles, are considered as separate. So office orders, conduct, and mechanisms of office are distinct units of analysis of institutional action. Therefore, they may be subjected to disjunctive normative judgments. That is to say, on this view, when we are up to assessing the, in the uh, institutional action, for instance, whether it is accountable or not, what we should be studying proceeds on, along two different tracks. We should be studying whether institutions are designed in a, such a way that makes them, for instance, accountable, whether the mechanisms are designed for this purpose. And then we should also see separately how the office holders that act within the context of this institutional action behave. So the, the uses they make of the power of office they are given. That separate of the sector standards of uh, normative assessment. An alternative view is emphasizing, emphasizes rather the continuity between the two components, the rule-based and the role-based component. On this view of institutional action, office order conduct and mechanisms of office constitute a unique unit of analysis of institutional action. They are therefore subjected to unify normative judgments. And the thought here, if you wish, is very simple. When we describe an institution, it's hardly um, satisfactory simply to go uh, and refer to uh, written rules and mechanisms. If we wanted to describe and assess institutional action, certainly we wanted to see how institutions work concretely. And to say how institutions work concretely, we have no other way that uh, looking at what the peace orders do within the scope that the institution allows them uh, to do. So um, to uh, illustrate um, why it makes a difference to distinguish between the continuity and the discontinuity view of institutional action, uh, let me refer back uh, very quickly to my uh, previous work uh, on uh, political corruption. So the two main normative accounts of political corruption uh, that are um, opposite um, at the moment uh, in, political, uh, in political theory, normative political theory, the institutionalist view and the relational uh, view of um, the corruption adopt respectively a discontinuity and a continuity theory of institutional action. Um, so for the institutionalist theory of corruption, which has been advocated by such uh, theorists as Lawrence Lessig, the, um, Seamus Miller and uh, Dennis Thompson, um, corruption is a matter of institutional mechanisms that is, is mainly a matter of institutional design that distract institutions from the pursuit of their defining purposes. So we have a corrupt institution when an institution is governed by rules 
that distract them from the purposes on which it should be uh, designed to uh, depend. An institution therefore can be corrupt even if none of the members do anything concretely corrupt with their action, because it is a matter of institutional design, not of office orders behavior, this continuity between, uh, between the two. The standard example given in the literature is that of a private electoral campaign financing. So in such countries as the United States, it is perfectly legal for um, people who stand for uh, elections to get money from private uh, donors, lobbies, or even uh, individuals. Um, so when they accept money, they do nothing objectionable. And when they are elected, if they act in a way that responds to the interest of those uh, that are um, that have uh, financed their campaigns, again, they do nothing wrong, at least in the sense of Latin, which is against any form of rule. Nevertheless, their argument is that the um, institution of democratic elections in the United States is nevertheless corrupted because the rules by which it works exposes uh, to the, expose the institution to the undue uh, influence of uh, private interest. On the relational uh, theory, uh, which is the theory I have developed with Maria Paola Ferretti in uh, the uh, book um, I just uh, mentioned, uh, corruption instead, um, or uh, is also, uh, as I prefer to say, is uh, mainly a matter of office orders interrelated conduct. So it's not so much a matter of institutional design, but it's a matter of institutional practice. What's the thought here? The thought is that, um, of course, uh, there are certain mechanisms, uh, certain rules uh, that may distract uh, an institution from pursuing its purposes or um, satisfying, fulfilling its raison d'etre. Nevertheless, uh, rules only create occasions for corruption. They create the context for corruption, but we have corruption, strictly speaking, only if office orders use the powers of office in a way that is corrupt. And what is a corrupted way to use powers of office? It is a use of a power of office for the pursuit of an agenda whose rationale may not be vindicated as clear and with the terms of the power mandate. This is problematic because using powers of office in this way uh, creates, um, makes uh, office orders um, deviate from uh, the logic of, that characterizes their institutional, uh, their institutional action. Uh, the example, uh, one of the examples we discuss in the book is the example of nepotism. So nepotism is an institutional practice that even if it's not formally ruled out by law uh, in many uh, institutions, nevertheless represents a form of corruption independently of the mechanisms, independently of the design of the institution, insofar as it makes office orders use their power of office for a logic which run contrary to the spirit and the letter of their mandate, which whatever it is, being public office is certainly not that to favor their near and dear ones. So in this way, uh, we can see that uh, distinguishing between uh, the two views of institutional action, discontinuity and continuity, is a very important distinction, not only in analytical theory, but also in practice, because it allows us to make different assessment of the quality of institutional action. It makes us focus on different places, on different logic where political corruption can uh, materialize. Now, um, on this view, and here let me get to uh, accountability more uh, directly, um, depending on uh, whether we adopt a continuity or a discontinuity view of institutional action, we might end up with two very different views of accountability of public institutional action. And here I would like to propose a distinction between uh, external and internal accountability. Um, just a small uh, aside, um, 
I'm not a huge fan of dichotomies in general. Um, I believe they tend to oversimplify the complexities um, of uh, the objects of investigation, especially uh, when politics uh, is at stake. So although you'll be seeing me uh, and you've seen me uh, dividing uh, my discussion into pairs, um, I do not consider necessarily them as dichotomical. So I'm really happy to accommodate uh, other forms um, of, uh, of theory uh, and accounts of institutional action here. Here. These are just two that are relevant. So again, you may have a different understanding of accountability and that might be relevant for institutional action and maybe uh, we may want to discuss them later on. But there are at least two ways in which we can conceive the accountability of public institutions, which is very important to identify and distinguish. External accountability is a kind of outward looking accountability. Internal accountability is a kind of inward looking accountability. What do I mean by this? So outward looking accountability um, is uh, um, typical of a rule-based view of institutions, which uh, allows uh, and uh, champions for a distinction between institutional rules and institutional actions and roles. Uh, from this point of view, um, accountable institutional action is uh, concerns an external assessment of institutional mechanisms, for instance, by looking at standard indicators or mechanisms external audit of institutional action, or, or and the external assessment of the office holder's individual behavior, for instance, by judicial investigation, if something against the rules happens, or even the kind of democratic accountability. So if uh, an accountable institutional action, an institutional action that can respond, that can give an account for uh, the ways in which it uses public power, then these accounts in, an, in the outward looking view of accountability are accounts that have an external interlocutor. So here accountability is external in two senses. We look at the outputs, of institutions, what institutions produce and deliver by direction. And uh, these uh, kind of institute and this kind of assessment can be done by looking at the institution from the outside. So in this, these are the typical uh, senses in which uh, democratic institutions, uh, we say that a parliamentary assembly is accountable to the citizens um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, um, consider also the internal, uh, inward-looking uh, view of accountability. Here, the emphasis is given rather to institutional roles uh, rather than institutional uh, rules, and the approach adopted is a continuity approach to institutional action. Here, accountability, so the account that um, of institutional action that we should be able to produce is internal in the sense that it concerns the internal assessment of institutional practices. That is the rule governed action of office holders as in, uh, it, uh, in its interrelatedness, in its internal interdependence. So uh, again here, uh, we have a twofold sense in which this accountability is internal. It's internal because it concerns the relation between office holders, the uses of power they make, and how they can justify to one another the uses of power they make, whether they are coherent with the terms of their mandate or not. And it's internal also in the sense that it requires the point of view of the office holders in order to be appreciated. Because institutional action on, on this account, it's something that concerns the internal working of the institution, the, those who are best positions to make sense of whether institutional action um, is accountable or not are those who are inside uh, the institution which doesn't mean, uh, of course, embracing some kind of elitarian view of institutions by which office orders are a sort of um, 
entity separated and immune from external scrutiny. Uh, as I said, I don't believe in stark oppositions and dichotomy. Uh, external accountability is important, but when we assess the accountability of institutional action, we shouldn't be forgetful also uh, of this internal dimension. What makes office orders accountable to one another for the uses they make of the power of office and uh, by being accountable to one another, what puts them in the position of sustaining by their interrelated action the working of their uh, institution. So um, my um, suggestion uh, is that in our discussions of accountability, we should also, uh, besides the traditional forms of accountability, uh, democratic accountability and uh, judicial accountability um, and so on and so forth that we have in mind, we should add a further category, uh, which I call office accountability. The argument here, or better the claim I make, is that to analyze and assess how a public institution works, one must also adopt a more perspective on institutional action in order to analyze and assess the conduct of the office holders in their institutional capacity. The one important question of accountability concerns how the office holders' interrelated actions may form a coherent whole, that is the institutional action, capable of upholding the working of their institution in virtue, uh, in view of the normative ideas that justify its existence, that is the institution raison d'etre. So this allows us also to ask the question of the structural grounds of accountability between office holders, which is what I call office accountability. Now, um, this is the positive side of the negative story I've been uh, telling in my work on uh, political corruption, where political corruption, just to give you an illustration, is presented as a violation precisely of this idea of office accountability. So on my view of political corruption, there's political corruption when an office holder um, behaves in a way that meets to, um, conditions, necessary and sufficient conditions. There must be an office holder who acts in their institutional capacity, which is what um, I call the office condition, for the pursuit of an agenda whose rationale is not coherent with the terms of the mandate. So here you have, uh, take the example of nepotism I gave earlier on, uh, someone, for instance, who is acting in the context of a hiring procedure for public office and favors among the many candidates, one uh, with whom she has a personal uh, relationships. Office condition is satisfied, this person is acting in her institutional capacity, mandate condition is satisfied because whatever is the power mandate with which the power of hiring someone for public office is given, it certainly does not include uh, promoting personal uh, relationships. So the emphasis on office holders acting within a system of interrelated roles brings to the fore the pattern of institutional interaction that instantiate political corruption as a matter of institutional practice. And that's where the continuity view uh, can um, illustrate the, uh, the reasoning structure. Now, um, I think that um, this uh, idea of office accountability is promising, um, among many things, um, because it can help um, triggering, uh, I think, a further reflection also on the categories of responsibility for institutional action uh, that uh, we may have. Um, so here uh, in the debate of the normative assessment of institutional action, uh, there are again two main views of how we should be uh, understanding the responsibility of public institutions. An individualist view, whereby institutional action is reduced to the action of the single uh, members of the institution and a collectivist view by which uh, institutions are conceived as group agents uh, to whom a direct responsibility can be attributed. 
And in general, um, the, uh, the exercise of attributing responsibility for institutional action is very difficult because given the complexities of institutional action, it is really not clear how to assign the moral responsibility for institutional actions and also dysfunctions. Think, for instance, again, as an illustrative example, cases of a systemic uh, corruption, cases of systemic bribery, or again, uh, cases of systemic uh, nepotism, whereby uh, some kind of uh, familistic or partial rule of hiring uh, surreptitiously come to supplant uh, a more impartial, impartial um, hiring, hiring procedure. Now, uh, it's very difficult in these cases to establish the responsibilities for uh, what makes institutional action fail uh, and derail. And that's uh, because um, sometimes this process of deterioration are very gradual. Sometimes uh, uh, office orders change over time. So those who initiated the process of corruption or deterioration are no more in office uh, when the corruption has become systemic or even because certain people just come in in media stress and they're not even aware that they are participating in the corrupt practices. Also, there is also a certain degree of self-deception that office orders might uh, put in action when they are a member of a systemic, um, a, dis a systemically dysfunctional system. And this is true for corruption, for injustice, and for different forms of institutional uh, failures. Now, um, so in these cases, we have the problem that Dennis Thompson has defined as the problem of the many hands. Uh, so when different hands contribute uh, to um, realizing a certain state of affairs in such a complex way that, that the contribution of the different hands cannot really be disentangled. But then there are also epistemic problems I was mentioning, various forms of tenting reasoning, like for instance, self-deception. Now, um, on these, uh, um, against this background, uh, it seems that uh, both individualist and collectivist views of responsibilities face, face some serious problems. Individual uh, view of responsibility that try to single out the contributive responsibility of each single individual of a certain systemic state of affair tend to fare uh, quite badly in terms of assigning backward looking for responsibility for the many hands problem I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Although they may, they may fare better in terms of forward looking responsibility, because if we search for individuals, then it's easier to uh, single out who's actually responsible, for instance, for remedy. You might not have been responsible for causing the corruption of a system, but because you are here, uh, and now you can be responsible for remedying it and making sure the corruption doesn't happen anymore. On the other hand, collective responsibility might fare better in terms of backward looking responsibility, because if we are capable of saying that institutions are collective agents, group agents, then they can be collectively responsible for uh, this type of, uh, this, for the type of dysfunction we, uh, we consider. But it's very difficult to establish forward looking responsibilities, because to say that the institution as a whole is responsible for remedying a situation um, seems to be very vague in terms of uh, prescribing what kind of remedial actions should be taken. So my suggestion is to integrate also a third form of responsibility, which is interrelated responsibility. Interrelated responsibility is a sort of a um, combined kind of responsibility because it's the responsibility that the office orders bear as a group, but made of individuals. So it's not assigning uh, responsibility to an opaque collective agents and not simply holding individual office orders responsible for a systemic failure, but it's a matter of holding um, office orders as a group of interrelated agents as interrelatedly responsible for the failure of or success of institutional action. Office orders in this sense can be held individually morally responsible, but as they are a part of in an interrelated group of agents. In this sense, uh, we can assign both backward looking and forward looking responsibilities for institutional action and institutional failure. 
the backward-looking responsibility concerns the office holder's failure of um, being accountable for their action in their institutional capacity. And this may mean uh, two things. They might either be responsible because they themselves failed to uh, act in an accountable way, that is, by um, pursuing by their action an agenda that is coherent with the terms of the power mandate. So, for instance, because they were the agents of nepotism, but they can also be therefore looking responsible if they fail to hold the other office holders accountable for their action. So, if my colleague makes a nepotistic use of uh, their power of office and they do nothing, and um, if I suspect something, or even if I don't suspect anything, just simply by um, standing uh, by your side and taking responsibility for institutional action myself, I may be implicated in uh, the institutional dysfunction at stake. And forward-looking responsibility, of course, concerns the remedy for uh, deficits of office accountability, the kind of action that office holders uh, as a group of agents are expected to take for institutional function and dysfunction. Uh, I call this um, the practice of answerability, uh, which is uh, the translation in practice of the duty of office accountability, which characterizes and defines um, wealth functioning institutional action. So um, when uh, such uh, institutional dysfunctions as political corruption occur, office holders should engage as a matter of duty of office uh, in good faith uh, in practices of answerability. So here, uh, if you wish, I think um, we have the ground for distinguishing between three concepts which are often mixed uh, in discussion. Accountability, which concerns uh, uh, the primary duty of office, uh, office holders acting in keeping uh, with the terms of the power mandate. Answerability, which is the practice by which office holders check upon each other uh, to sustain jointly together the functioning of their institution and responsibility, which is the kind of attributions, the call to action that we make to office holders and the interrelated body of agents. Accountability, answerability, responsibility have clear uh, and differentiated meanings uh, in this sense. So uh, these practices of answerability are mainly conceived as communicative justificatory practices that office holders, through which office holders can assume responsibility for the failure of the institutional action, take corrective action, and therefore sustaining the working of their institution. And uh, this is a sense in which we can reconceive, for example, uh, anti-corruption uh, in a way that uh, internalizes the efforts of office holders to uh, react uh, to this type of institutional dysfunctions how different possibilities are on offer here. We may discuss them later if you, uh, if you like, but think for instance, procedures for internal whistleblowing. So channels through which uh, the members of an institution can um, flag possible deviations uh, from uh, office accountability and therefore uh, initiate a process of self-critical appraisal uh, of the action as a joint uh, body of uh, agents. So um, again, negative side of the story, political corruption is a deficit of office accountability. Uh, and what I've tried to do is to show how by reference to such dysfunction as political corruption, as a deficit of office accountability, we can work a positive account of how institutional action should be structured in order to realize a specific but important form of accountability, that is office accountability, which uh, by making office orders respond to each other for the uses they make of their power mandate, mobilizes the internal resources this institution has to be well-functioning. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to comments or questions that you may have. Thank you.
so much uh, from our end here. Um, and I'm sure the people who are uh, participating remotely join us uh, in, in thanking you. Um, I, I believe the easiest is probably that uh, you field uh, the questions, uh, maybe first coming from um, the uh, audience following remotely, uh, and then we'll collect questions from, uh, from uh, this part of, of the, uh, the, the room, maybe in a, in a second moment. I'm fine with whatever procedure you suggest. Okay. Uh, so, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Emanuela, for your presentation. You, you, conv you convinced me to buy your book, then I am going to read it later. <laughs> Just uh, two questions. The first one, when you made the difference between uh, institutions and relations uh, in handling office holders activities. <clears throat> I do not know if you make a difference between relational, uh, a relational perspective and an informal institutional perspective. Because when you put the example of nepotims, we know that nepotims also has its own rules although are not writing, are not legal. What I am saying is also families works with their own rules, depending on culture, traditions, etc. Then it is possible to make a difference between informal institutions, those that are not written, are not legal, but those that have uh, rules in a way, it is possible to make a difference between informal institutions and relational uh, uh, relational behaviors or not. That's uh, the first one. And the second one, when you uh, spoke to us about uh, interrelated responsibility, you also uh, mentioned uh, the relevance to see a little bit more uh, whistleblowing processes. Taking into account your perspective of uh, uh, normative theory, how we can improve whistleblowing processes in cases of systematic corruption. What I am saying is it's very easy to say, just blow the whistle, but we know that uh, people do not blow the whistle because they are fear of retaliations or maybe because they think that nobody is going to believe in what uh, they are saying, then in a normative perspective, there is also a way to think on how to improve whistleblowing processes or whistleblowing actions. And thank you so much again for your presentation, Professor. Thank you. Um, can I respond question by question? Yes, please, yes. Okay, thanks, excellent. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so uh, concerning the first, uh, the first question, uh, very interesting. Um, so here, um, that's a part of the problem with when one speaks about um, institutions, uh, right? Uh, because um, if you have a view of institutions as um, some kind of rule govern practice, uh, then that may apply uh, to all sorts of uh, human uh, better com configurations of human action uh, that are structured uh, somehow. And this brings the question of informal and um, uh, formal and informal institutional action. So um, everything I uh, said in terms of the accountability of institutional action um, in my uh, talk concerns uh, formal uh, institutions. So the institutions um, I had um, as, as an object of analysis where the fairly large set of institutions that I mentioned at the beginning, going from governmental institutions to administrative offices uh, and so on and so forth. It is true that within the framework of these formal institutions, informal um, institutions in the sense of practices may uh, develop. And in fact, sometimes, and that's the interesting thing about corruption, they can come to replace 
the formal rules uh, by which institutions uh, function in such a way that really transform uh, institutions. They're uh, not so much in their purposes because sometimes uh, uh, they may uh, end up delivering the same kind uh, of, uh, uh, of goods or service, but they're internal uh, working. Um, so um, in this sense, uh, I think that there is uh, much to explore in terms of the relation between the internal, uh, between the formal and informal dimensions of institutional action. It is not a distinction that tracks, uh, however, the distinction between institutional action and uh, office holders uh, relations. Because again, even in the case of the office holders relations, you may have informal and formal office holders relations. So you may have the relationships office holders entertain in quay the occupant of institutional roles when they, when they act by the normative status that is attributed to them by entering the institution. That's the sense of referring to office holders acting in their institutional capacity, for example. And you can also have the relationships between office holders that they develop more informally, uh, exercising other powers that are not those who are entrusted to their uh, institutional roles. So, um, I would say that um, the um, distinction between formal and informal doesn't track the distinction between the institutional and the relational, but both of the two dimensions have a formal and an informal uh, connotation that is definitely worth uh, exploring uh, to understand in the working of an institution. Uh, then as concerns your second question, um, so I've, uh, I won't be saying uh, that uh, there's also uh, a book on uh, whistleblowing uh, to add to, to the reading list, uh, but um, I will give you a substantial uh, answer by saying that uh, I, um, I do think that as is, and uh, I'm really grateful for you, um, to you for giving me the opportunity to specify this, as is the practice of whistleblowing is not particularly conducive to the kind of an accountability and answerability I was talking about. And the reason why it isn't is because uh, at the time, under the current circumstances, whistleblowing is mainly uh, an individual act of resistance. So in most of its manifestations, whistleblowing uh, manifests itself to the action of an individual office holder, uh, Chelsea Manning, Idris Snowden, um, or many other more uh, everyday whistleblowers that uh, for reasons of conscience sometimes, integrity or justice, decide to um, counteract some kind of uh, wrong that is happening within uh, the institution where they work. Uh, the kind of whistleblowing that is actually conducive to the form of accountability I have defended is actually an institutional practice. So it's a practice which is standardized and that does not see whistleblowing as a more or less praiseworthy act of an individual who stands up against some kind of dysfunction, but it's in fact the mobilization of office holders, again, as an interrelated group of agents that takes in their hand the institutional action. And I think that is very important. Otherwise, we end up having a very over-demanding account of whistleblowing that treats whistleblowers, sort of sacrifices the action of some individuals uh, on the altar of institutional action. And that's a moral demand that cannot be placed on anyone uh, reasonably. Great, thanks very much. Uh, we have Chiara Valsen Giacomo on the list. Chiara. Ciao, Chiara. Yes. Hello. Hi. Ciao, ciao, Emanuela. Uh, it's nice to see you. I'm very happy. It, it's very interesting to keep following the development of your research. And as always, you gave a very clear and, um, and concise presentation. So thank you for this. I have two small uh, question of understanding. One regards the method and the other one regards the scope of the research. So regarding the method, I was just wondering whether you would um, uh, uh, perceive it as fair to like, identify your research as belonging to the realm of like realist non-ideal theory 
I'm asking this because like in the beginning when you were introducing the work, like it seemed like very, it, or at least what you were saying in the beginning was reminding me very strongly of, of, of an article that Carlo Burelli recently published on the European Journal of Political Theory. So, and uh, the article is about like functional political normativity. So this idea that like political institutions um, have um, like that, um, like there, that there are functions that that political institutions have functions that alone, like independently of like any moral considerations, have like this prescriptive force. So it seems exactly, uh, or it seems very similar to like the methodological assumptions that you are making here in your research. So I was wondering if you would agree with this. And and then the second question about the scope is. Um, I had the feeling while listening to you in the presentation that, so I think it's clear, so it is obvious as a premise, I think it is obvious that you're interested into uh, political theory and of course your framework applies uh, at the moment to uh, political institutions, that's uh, uh, crystal clear, but uh, while I was listening to the presentation I had this feeling that actually everything you're saying could be just as well applied to like corporate governance and I don't know if there is like, and I, I assume you don't discuss this also in the book. I, I apologize if that's the case and I don't know this. Uh, so I was wondering if there is a reason like beyond your um, mere like intellectual interest, uh, why you're not discussing the applications more for like private institutions. So that's it, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara. It's always very uh, spot on questions. So I'll, I'll start from the second, uh, just because it's easier. Uh, no, it's easier. No, it's, it's uh, my answer is quicker. And it's, uh, I totally agree with you. And I'm actually very happy that you think that. Uh, so the reason why I haven't been discussing um, the um, implications or uh, the possibility to extend um, these analyses uh, to um, non-public, which includes uh, um, private or even semi-private or semi-public uh, institutions, so private providers of public services, for example, uh, it's uh, entirely biographical. And it's due to the fact that uh, my main uh, work uh, on these issues so far have been um, uh, carried out, um, as Odile had mentioned, with, with Maria Paola Ferretti, and we do disagree on this point, uh, while we don't disagree on others. So, so far, uh, we sort of moved on the areas where we agree rather than where we disagree. And the reason why we disagree is that I do believe uh, that this account has also something to say in terms of um, non-public uh, institutions. Um, and the other biographical reasons why uh, this, has, this hasn't been studied so far is that it's just uh, the next item in the agenda. So my next phase of the research, um, and I've, I've recently put in a, 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 an application to the SNF uh, uh, precisely on this. Uh, so asking the extent to which uh, this account of institutional action can also make sense of um, non-purely uh, public um, institutions and also the corruption of non-purely public institutions. So I'm really glad that you see uh, these analogies uh, and we'll be talking again about this uh, if you like. Um, on the other hand, I must totally disagree with the first um, methodological comment uh, you make. So uh, I can't think of anyone further from a realist approach to political theory than myself. Um, so I've had endless discussions with Carlo, with Enzo, uh, Rossi, Max Litt, and, and all the crowd. Uh, and simply because, but that's perhaps my problem, I just don't think there is anything like a realist normativity. Um, so, um, uh, and, and again, this is uh, an object of, uh, of a paper on which I'm working at the moment, um, where I, I do totally agree with, because you said a methodological uh, realist or non-ideal normativity. So certainly uh, what I try to do is to develop a non-ideal account of the sources uh, of normativity, 
which has some kind of practice dependence uh, into it. But it's not just like the kind of normativity that emerges uh, out of positive institutional practice as some practice-based uh, dependent account or realist account would have it. Uh, this has more to do with the normative features of institutional action. So it's an internal kind of normativity which can emerge in institutions because institutions are structures of role of the kind I have, uh, I have described. So uh, there is a certain sense in which it's not totally idealized as a Rosian uh, normativity would be, uh, but it's not um, realistic uh, in the sense uh, of being practice dependent uh, as the realist had it. Another thing uh, which um, also uh, needs clarifying. So uh, I said at the beginning that I'm still torn uh, between the usages uh, of how to call um, this the property institution have when they work uh, well. So in some work, I called it well functioning. Uh, in some work in progress we are doing, for instance, with Michele Bocchiola, um, we call it the operability of an institution. Um, and that's mainly because we don't want to uh, give the impression that we have this kind of functionalist account. Because you see, this functionalist account of institutions follow some, a, a kind of etiological uh, view of institutional action for which institutions are built for a purpose and the purpose defines the institution as they are. And this is very different from the kind of internal logic uh, I'm proposing uh, in, in the work. So that's why I'm, I'm not still comfortable with labels, um, precisely because I wouldn't want to raise um, the, the impression that there is this kind of analogy where this analogy, in fact, is not there. Um, so um, again, uh, there is more to come uh, also on this, uh, on this topic, because it, it's a very important one. It's not just terminological, it, it, it's substantial or methodological methodological as you put it. Very good. Uh, we have one question on the chat uh, from Denny Ivanov. Um, I was wondering about the time dimension of the story since formal institutions are usually sluggish to change. Uh, is it the same for accountability and what conditions can it change, crisis, etc.? Yeah, thanks. That, that's the, the time dimension of institutional action is very um, important and is very interesting um, for uh, uh, under at least two, uh, two aspects. Uh, one aspect concerns uh, the uh, internal coherence of institutional action, precisely because on my account of institutional action, institutions are more than roles and mechanisms, but institutions are the interrelated action of the office orders, but because um, the concrete individuals that fill institutional roles vary uh, over time, there is a, a problem of consistency in describing institutional action. And, um, and this is an open issue. Uh, it is an open issue um, which requires a further research. Um, and um, I'm really not sure what direction to take there, uh, but it's certainly uh, in terms of describing institutional action, it, it's really very important. The other um, dimension in which time um, is important, uh, which was perhaps uh, the one more directly suggested in the question, concerns uh, institution, uh, a kind of inertia uh, that characterizes institutional action. And so institutions tend to reproduce themselves and their standards. And this problem is a problem that cuts across many different accounts of institutional action. So the teleological account of institutional action by which institutions are defined by their purposes and their capacity to fulfill their purposes has this kind of inertia because once you define the purpose of the institution, then whatever deviation from pursuing that purpose can be seen as problematic. But sometimes we simply change their mind about the purposes uh, that an institution should serve, or we might have different priorities that account uh, over time. Um, and, and we see that all the time. So 
the, the sanitary emergency where uh, we went, although calling an emergency situation that has been protracted for over two years uh, is a bit uh, odd, but anyway, the sanitary situation in which we are shows how the priorities of institutional action may change and may come in contrast with one another. So how do we account for this type of institutional change? It is also a problem for those normative account of institutions that say that the main virtue of institution is institutional integrity. Because again, when you speak about integrity, then what you are presupposing is that it's actually good if institution stays the same because something integral is something that doesn't change uh, by definition. And so again, you have this problem with time and change. So uh, some people uh, think that also uh, my view of institutions as based on an institution's raison d'etre and power mandate is open to the same kind of problem. Because if we define um, a well-functioning or an, uh, an operational institution as an institution that um, whose constitutive office holders use the power of office in keeping with the terms of the power mandate, then you say, well, power mandate are fixed and therefore institutional action tends to be, uh, even in this case, a static. But here uh, I, uh, I would want to respond that unlike institutional purposes or institutional functions, an institution's raison d'etre is in fact uh, open for uh, discussion between office holders. And that's exactly the spirit of my suggestion that we should mobilize the internal resources of an institution in order to define institutional action and adopt this inward internal perspective. Because making office holders accountable to each other also means empowering office holders to say, hold on a minute, what are we going together as a group, as an institution? So the, the call to responsibility I was talking about is actually a call on office orders to self-scrutinize uh, the way in which they relate to each other and make use of their power of office. So in this sense, the power mandates and an institution raison d'etre are not set in stone, but should be seen as a project that uh, office orders are constantly called on to rethink to revise, to put in question, in order to be always uh, aware of what they're doing uh, as a group. And precisely these communicative practices of self-reflection of self are the internal sources of normativity to which I was referring in my earlier response to, um, to Chiara. So I'm very much conscious of, these, uh, of, of the need for institutional action to be sensitive to um, change over time. And I think that this dimension that calls on office orders uh, to uh, always be alert and asking the question, what are we doing together? As the definitive moment of institutional action as a project is uh, um, a promising way to go. Great, thank you. Uh, Antoinette Chertz is on the list. Yes, thank you so much for, for the very interesting talk. My question um, goes a bit maybe beyond the, the field of, of um, what you've been talking about towards questions of accountability of international institutions. And I think one of um, the most important critiques of, of accountability of international institutions is often that we see accountability mechanisms, but they are very much based on the mandate um, of the institution and of the states who are actually creating the international institutions. And so we see an, account an accountability of these institutions towards those states who have created the institutions, but often the institutions are not accountable to other groups um, over whom they have a lot of power, right? So we see that they, they come apart here. And I was just wondering whether you think your account um, can also bring resources to that problem or whether you think that that is a whole different issue um, on the international level. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that's um, interesting. Uh, it's a um, sort of an extension to uh, an even more complex uh, domain um, of institutional action. Um, so uh, on the one hand, I would say that um, 
it seems that um, one diagnosis of the problem you were um, pointing at is a diagnosis that requires rethinking the categories of what I called outward looking um, responsibility or external uh, accountability or external accountability. So one way to put uh, the concerns that you were, you were voicing is to say, well, look, current mechanisms of outward looking accountability uh, are inadequate. They're inadequate because they uh, call. Well, in fact, um, now, now that I think of it, well, I think it's actually very interesting because what you said uh, could be saying that the current state of affairs privileges inward looking accountability with respect to certain types of mandates that are internalized uh, in the institution to the detriment of certain kind of outward looking accountability, uh, which concerns uh, um, people uh, over which uh, um, the uh, action of those institutions has an impact, although they did not contribute in defining uh, the, man the mandate. So it seems to fall in the square of uh, outward looking accountability. Accountability. However, I think that even in this case, uh, an inward looking practice of accountability of the dialogical kind that was suggesting can actually be uh, conducive again to problematize this kind of issues. Because you see, I, it, it's really this hold on moment uh, that I think is crucial uh, to initiate, to trigger these practices of accountability. The idea that um, office orders, those who perhaps have the feeling, the perception that there is something lacking in the kind of accountability uh, of their institution, have the opportunity to call their colleagues uh, to action, to initiate a problem of um, a, a process of, problem, of problematization of what, of what they're doing. So probably I think that the, com the, pro the problem you have pointed out is so complex that would um, require to be addressed um, effectively both a, a rethinking of the terms of external accountability, so the accountable to whom question made, um, made uh, broader, and also see the extent to which uh, opening the space for internal uh, criticism, internal self-scrutiny may open a breach that can actually help uh, revising uh, practices of accountability from within, not only from the outside. Very good. Um, I think uh, uh, I can't see anyone else uh, on the on the uh, on the list here. So uh, Odil Aman, who is next to me, has a question. Just just stepping in. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So as you know, I, I come from a legal angle, and so perhaps my, my question will be, will be obvious to you or, or, or will not be uh, what you are mostly focusing on. But I am interested in the, how you talked about these internal mechanisms of accountability and these justificatory practices, which should be uh, encouraged within the institution. And what I keep asking myself is how can we really create incentives for the institution to change from within if there is no external trigger or some kind of scandal or pressure coming from citizens? Because if the, the institution is forced to change due to an external factor, I, I can really see potential for, for evolution. Uh, also, if something is clearly illegal, then the institution must change. But how can we trigger this change from within given how uh, inter interlinked and entangled these interests are sometimes? And this also applies to not just to parliament, for example, where parliamentarians must decide whether to lift the immunity, for example, of an MP. And they are all colleagues, they all know each other. And it's really hard to you know, to, to go beyond these personal networks and to really decide something that's effective. And this also applies to other institutions like, uh, uh, for example, a, a higher education institution where there are conflicts of interest and, and uh, these are colleagues or, or any kind of institution where there is this proximity between people. How do you go, how do you deal with this difficulty? 
Thanks. Uh, no, that, that, that's a very important um, question. Um, I, would, um, I would probably want to say two things um, in response. Uh, so the first thing um, is a more straightforward um, reply to the question. So uh, how do we go about uh, triggering uh, this kind of uh, changes from uh, inside? Um, and that's um, and this sort of brings us back um, a little bit to um, one of the, the initial questions. Uh, um, so Nicolas' uh, question also in terms of uh, whistleblowing and how uh, internal practices or the internal action of individual office holders can actually be uh, protected in such a way that if there is uh, one uh, office holder or a group of office holders within the institution that sense it that something enough can actually has the instrument to initiate this kind of change without um, making uh, a huge moral sacrifice. Because certainly the answer to your question cannot be um, the goodwill of individuals. And that would be, if you wish, a sort of virtue uh, theory of institutions. Perhaps some old fashioned Republicans would say, well, it's a matter of the virtues of the soldier that should stand up against uh, uh, these dynamics. But, but that's, that, that's not the direction I want to go. So a first thing would be that there is um, an allegiance between internal um, forces and, inter and, and internal forces, such, such that um, conditions can be created to um, open up channels and inaugurate um, forms, uh, institutional practices that can actually sustain the action of individuals when individuals decide to come, uh, to come forward. And that would be uh, the more um, operative uh, answer um, I could give to your question. But then there's also a more um, structural or uh, uh, theoretical answer, um, if you wish, uh, which uh, concerns uh, um, a distinction that to me is very important, which is uh, because this goes again, the different categories of responsibilities I've tried to distinguish. Um, especially in terms of backward looking and, and forward looking um, action. And here, I think it's uh, very important in this kind of context, given the complexities you were uh, mentioning, to distinguish between the source of uh, the trigger for a certain action. And uh, so who initiates the change? Where does the force to initiate the change come from? And on the other hand, who is entrusted with the responsibility to carry out the change? And they don't really have to be the same person. So where I think uh, current uh, approaches to correcting institutional um, actions uh, um, uh, are uh, a little wanting is that they tend to identify these two elements by outsourcing entirely the task to external agencies. So external agencies, oversight commissions uh, should start investigations and they should also, to say the least, supervise office orders while they carry out the actions which are imposed or proposed, if you want to be more charitable from, from the outside. While um, what is a clear, I, I hope, implication of my account is that the trigger may still be external because sometimes, as you perfectly explained, there are such mechanisms that are so entrenched um, that it's tremendously difficult to discard them and to initiate the change, even to detect them from the inside. Also for the mechanism of self-deception and adaptation I was referring to. But once this diagnosis is carried out, then uh, it's uh, internal agents were entrusted with the responsibility to carry out the therapy. So the diagnosis may come from the outside, but the agents of the therapy must necessarily also involve individuals inside. Otherwise, there's this dimension of accountability and forward looking of, of responsibility, which is frustrated in a sense that I think is detrimental to uh, the operability of an institution. 
Very Thank good. Um, no, Arno Schneemann, for what I think is going to be the last question today, Arno. Um, thank you very much. Well, I, unfortunately, I pressed the uh, applaud instead of uh, raising my hand, but that's not to mean that I'm not applauding afterwards. Um, maybe you have touched upon this point already in your answers to um, uh, Odile and Nicola. Nevertheless, I was I was uh, I wanted to um, highlight again or 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 ask about a, a, a potential epistemic problem within the institution, which concerns. The, what is the, actually the true mandate of that institution? Because in, this, in the way you framed your answer to the whistleblowing case, case, it seems that we are always in the presence of a very clear case, either it is corrupted or it is not corrupted. However, I think that sometimes it is not that clear what the true mandate of an institution may be. So for example, Snowden thought, uh, I don't know, the NSA is not acting within its mandate. Uh, his supervisor may have uh, thought differently. So I was thinking about how do you deal with the problem when it might be the case that office holders are not even aware of being corrupt because they think they're acting within the mandate. And if they're only internally accountable to each other, that corruption might actually never be well uh, discovered in a sense. So I was thinking or ask, I want to ask you whether, you whether you think that's a problem or whether you think that will be um, well discovered in a sense. Yeah, that would be my question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Arno. Um, so, um, well, to start with, uh, I don't think there is there there is any such a thing as a true mandate of an institution. So that, that's a notion I would reject, uh, precisely for the reasons of. Um, normativity that I was uh, referring earlier on. So I guess that what is crucial uh, to my account is that uh, office holders are made aware that they are uh, the authors uh, of uh, the Rome mandate in a certain sense, in the sense that, of course, there are coordinates within which office orders uh, move, which is, which is basically the reason that of the institution, meaning the reason why we establish an institution. So we don't create institutions uh, out of nothing. Uh, we, we do that to respond to certain kind of social needs, action coordination, and so on and so forth. But then the specification of the terms of their mandate is something that should always be open to scrutiny and self-scrutiny. So you are absolutely right uh, that uh, office orders might be in very deep disagreement concerning the terms of their mandate. And sometimes our data are very, uh, are even quite opaque. Uh, so it's not entirely clear what the terms of the mandate sometimes, sometimes are. But uh, the idea of looking at these answerability practices as dialogical practices that wants to initiate this process of self-scrutiny goes exactly in that direction, in the direction that they say, hold on a minute, what are we doing here? So the idea is that if there is a suspect that there is something that doesn't, um, uh, that the that, that, it is not appropriate or uh, that is in contradiction with the terms of the mandate. Uh, my argument has been that it is the office holder's responsibility to question uh, this very practice and start a process of critical uh, investigation. So what is important is not uh, the truth detecting capacity of this mechanism, but the uh, communicative uh, enhancement capacity uh, that they have. Um, so in, in, in that sense, uh, I wouldn't want to go, um, I don't go in the direction of uh, speaking about the true mandate uh, of an institution. And that's even why I don't think that these external means of accountability are sufficient on their own, because it's not like you go and read the, the statute of an institution, the regulations or an ethical code of conduct, and you in, immediately have an idea of how the institution should be working, and then you can check against the standard. Uh, in, this is a bit, you know, this kind, even, even in universities, we're more and more exposed to this kind of accountability of our action, performer indicators. And I think this is one of the 
quickest way to deresponsibilize the members of the institutions from taking um, in their own hands um, the definition of their mandates and the critical assessment of their uh, of their mandates. So I'm uh, totally aware um, of the problem you uh, you mentioned. I think they're a very important problem. And in fact, it's a bit uh, to respond to those problems that I think um, this account, uh, this complementary account that I suggested is, is necessary. With all the problem of deception, self-deception, tainting reasoning granted, because they are there. They are there and um, quite honestly, they are just how human mind work uh, and uh, we just have to, uh, to, to strive. Uh, just let me end by quoting uh, old, good old John Rawls. We should strive for the best we can attain within the scope the world allows and the human mind allows, uh, I may want to add. <laughs> What a conclusion this is. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Emanuela, for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you for uh, such an engaged lecture uh, in the name of all of us present in the room. Uh, and I am sure in the name also of all of us uh, present remotely. Uh, it is, uh, it's been, it's always wonderful listening to, to you talk. Uh, but once again, thank you for being with us uh, today. Thank you very uh, much. It was uh, it was fun. Uh, yeah. So just what I needed to uh, end a very difficult and eventful day. Uh, this is, was a very very pleasant way to end it. Excellent. Well, all the best uh, to you uh, and to everyone. Have uh, have a great evening. Goodbye for now. Thank you.